This is the Focus Group. Negotiation. This is what you do in business. With Tim Bennett. Fuck her up, Buttercup. And John Nash. We never give up. It's the savvy side of 9 to 5. Who knew business talk could be so much fun? <laughs> Still one of still one of your favorite little little bits. You look at how blue I am today, John. See that? I was I was uh, hey, welcome to the focus group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host John Nash. Where we're all business except when we're not. And uh, I was criticized last week for my shirt. They said I looked like a lesbian that worked at Subaru. Still, <laughs> Who could, a, where'd you get people on Facebook said I looked this from. On the Facebook. On the Facebook. Somebody said on the book of face. On the book of face. Somebody said I look like a lesbian with my shirt on. So I, <laughs> I quickly decided I looked at it and I thought maybe it maybe it did add a little bit of bulk to me. So maybe I won't. I thought you look fine. Continue doing it. But um, so we hope everyone had a uh, enjoyable long weekend to the start of summer. It was Memorial Day uh, weekend. And uh, if you're uh, joining us live, thank you. We also have our YouTube channel at Focus Group Radio. And if you go to focusgroupradio.com, you can find out all the platforms where we're available to uh, watch us, take us along, whether you want audio, video, or both. We recommend both. And, uh, and what else do we have? And that was neat and clean. We have a number here in clean. studio if you want What's to It's our join number, us? John. 877. I want it bigger on the screen, John. 6846. You got to practice. You got John, John and Garrett in the booth. What, just, that's what <laughs> I, I, I like. rather like it when John does the hypnotic big or smaller thing. You want to wave to the crowd, boys? <laughs> we have there John. They are. And we have Garrett, our, 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 our associate our producers. producers. Make it all happen. And today, nicely, we've, uh, we have what John and I like to call a guest list. One of show. Tim's favorites. Tim is very fond of the guest list show. It allows us a little more to dig into. Leeway. 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 Yeah. And uh, which we haven't done in a while. We're also going to do a Tim's list this week. So later on in the show, be sure to call in and get your socks. And uh, and then John and I, John has a couple of articles we picked out. But before we, we get to all that, I wanted to, I guess the elephant in the room today is that, um, and you and I hadn't talked about it, which I was surprised over lunch. What did you think of Kathy Griffin's uh, oh, the, severed head of Trump, President Trump? Well, there you go. Quiet. So, <laughs> oh, my gosh. Holy moly. I don't know what to say because I'm not even sure that would have played well at Halloween. I mean, it, it seems a little like I, I. my answer is I saw a headline that said, hey, Kathy Griffin, uh, the 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 progressive movement doesn't need their own Ann Coulter. Yeah, I thought it was all? I thought it was in such poor taste. I know some people said, "Oh, it's freedom of speech," and people had done, uh, you know, burned effigies of of either Bush or President yeah. Obama, which I thought was wrong as well. Our president's the president; we might not like him, but uh, or agree with him, but you don't. I, I thought that was over the line. Myself, I don't know. And Anderson Cooper just came out with some statement about it. Like he thought it was in very poor taste as well. And they spend New Year's Eve together. They usually do the New well, Year's she, Eve. Well, she she hurried up and did an apology. Although it's kind of the cat's out of the bag. They, it's a whole mea, mea culpa of, mm -hmm. oh, now I'm going to apologize and it all Wasn't will be well. So, didn't we know that to be some some way of doing business? Do it and apologize for it later. Yeah. As opposed to <laughs> thinking the old about Bev Hawkshurst model yeah, from high school. Exactly. Lead ignorance. Lead ignorance. Right. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. You know, plead ignorance. So, well, that was easy enough. Then I thought that might be a longer <laughs> no, conversation. No, I, I thought you might have been a supporter of free speech. You know, yeah, I am. But I, I also, I just uh, severed head. Can't you make the point? Another. Yeah. I, I guess that's the, the fine line, right? Yeah. If you're going to make a point like that, there might be a better way of doing it, yeah. a more effective way than that. Well, ever that, since she uh, decided she wasn't going to, back on our old, old, uh, old platform on Sirius XM, I know. Not particularly us, but all the shows we had asked uh, for her, all the other OutQ shows had asked for her to come on. She refused to come on. Remember that? I do remember that. So ever since then, I was not a fan of hers. Um, <laughs> Tim doesn't hold a grudge. <laughs> well, listen. <laughs> Tim does not. I called her today to see if she wanted to come on and talk, but had a better chance of getting Hillary Clinton. So over there, I was down in Rehoboth over the... Uh, over Memorial Day. I was down there and, and did the boardwalk thing, and I... I Richard and... <sighs> So Richard's very competitive and, and doesn't seem like that guy. Yeah. And he and I have had lots of competitions. Who could throw the football furthest? Who could win in tennis? Who could do this? Who could do that? So we went to one of these penny arcades. And when you and Bob come down, you'll have to come. So Is the penny arcade kind of like the one we went to? Yeah, 1950s in New York Beach. Yeah, New York so Beach. this one, right, no okay. air conditioning, a bunch of fans. And you get the little tickets and whatever. Yeah, and I love that. And balls, 25 oh. cents. Sign me up. Sign me up. <sighs> 
killed me. What game were you playing? Ski ball, that ski ball oh, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then after he beats me there, then there was the koopy dolls. You throw them, so you throw the baseball. So I'm like, well, I'm surely going to. He's, he's South he Paul. He beat you there? He, he goes, puts his money, he goes, you know, I used to pitch. I was like, baloney. He used to pitch what? So <laughs> I used to pitch what? And he beat baloney. me there. He beat me. So it was two out of three. Who can win two out of three? So I said, you know, if when John and Bob come down, we're going to have to take them here. An and arcade challenge. Put them into the challenge. So did you have a slide for that? Did you put up a? Well, uh, there, there was a, it was just so a lot I, of people this, don't know way, where Rehoboth answers, is. I'm glad you did That's this. That's the state of Delaware. The small wonders. Delaware ta right. land of tax free shopping. So you see Philadelphia up there in the very top, John. If you're watching this on the on the uh, on YouTube or Facebook on the video. So from Philadelphia to where that star is, Rehoboth Beach, is about two hours and 15 minutes with no traffic. It's about 120 miles, maybe. And uh, But you can take the ferry, oh, see where Atlantic right. City is. Atlantic City is 60 right. miles from Philly there, but you can go down to the point there in Cape May and take the ferry over to Rehoboth, too, which some people do. Car ferry? If car or just go for the ride. Dover is where the big Air Force base but is. Does that take the same amount of time? Yeah, I, I've not done it. People do it and like it, but it, it, it avoids you having to go if you were in South Jersey coming all the way around. Uh, you, you, not an easy, not the easiest place to get to, but you could see D.C., Baltimore, Philly. It's a big and then LGBT you, destination as well as a family destination. And you uh, did the boardwalk, you said. Did the boardwalk, and then I just did you know, a picture of the streets. It's a very different, I'm excited for you to come down. I plan on spending a chunk of the summer there this year for the first time. I've never done the beach thing. I know you guys have. It's very different than P Town. So well, first um, of all, given its location and its accessibility, I mean, it, well, different you, crop. When you think people. about the Cape, yeah. you got to drive all the way out. You know, you're on that that road all the way to the end. I mean, it's yeah. like a very like it's a filtering system almost. So what did what did you do over the week? I did one of our road trips that I proposed last. Uh, so um, you're already hitting uh, the list. Well, I had to because I typical of me and actually Tim, like we're, we we knew about this exhibit back in November December of last year. And we're like, well, we're going to go see Hanna Barbera. Suddenly, the exhibit's no longer going to be there. So, um, so it's going to close. It, it was closed Monday. So we went. Uh, Bob and I took the car. We drove over to the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. The building on the right, if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, is the Norman Rockwell Museum. It's a it's a museum of American illustration, or illustration in general. Um, many of his Famous paintings are, Norman Rockwell's paintings are in that building. Both and rooms they, air conditioned? <laughs> Actually, it's pretty big on is the that, inside. Uh, and there's a downstairs that had speaking rooms and lecture halls and uh, event space. And then the other building that was over there is Norman Rockwell's last studio. And it turns out they shipped the building from a different part of the country to be here. That's a great looking building. Uh, and it's a beautiful studio. And if, it's situated on the top of a hill that overlooks a pond and a river. It's And this is in Stockbridge, Mass. It's a gorgeous area of the country. So um, beyond the Norman Rockwell portion of the museum, they had an exhibit of Hanna-Barbera um, stills and animation concept work and toys. And it was basically Hanna-Barbera, the architects of Saturday morning cartoons. I had no idea how many cartoons these guys are responsible really? for. Besides our favorites, it, it was Scooby-Doo, it was the Jetsons, Flintstones, Top Cat. Remember Top Cat? Yeah, I love Top Cat. Yeah, you know, all right, so here we start off with the Jetsons, and they had a lot of concept art for the Jetsons. The did family, you like the Jetsons? I did. I See, did. I, I, I was more, of, obviously, more of a Flintstones guy, but um, I... I watched it, but I didn't like it as much. I think it was on later. Okay, so yeah, the Flintstones so I was ready to go outside. and the Jetsons were actually, when they were first premiered, those the Flintstones actually was an evening show. It was a primetime yep. show. And it got terrible reviews. Uh, one critic called it an uncouth, <laughs> horrible show. So we're walking through the exhibit, and we come across Top Cat. And Bob says, this is one of those puzzle pieces. So Bob goes, oh, I love Top Cat. I'm like, Top Cat? He goes, Top Cat used to take out the napkin, and he used to eat the dead the fish. Yeah, and the... I said, why do you like Top Cat so much? And he said, because Top Cat used to play like he's rich, but he's really poor. <laughs> and I was like, ching, another piece of the puzzle. <laughs> um, so let's see what else. So some of the concept art. Oh, no. Here, my That's, you thought you were the little blonde. I loved you. Well, actually, I liked Haji. I, I was into Haji. I, I, I might have been the Indian Quest. kid. Oh, I love the Indian kid, Haji. Yeah. 
So uh, Johnny Quest was a show that changed the fortunes of Hanna-Barbera because of, it was a primetime show, and it was the first time the animators at Hanna-Barbera had to draw like normal-looking people as opposed to cats and dogs. Right. <laughs> so some of the concept, this is concept art for... You had that same hairdo in high school. I, I actually didn't. I was Floppy nicknamed Johnny hair. as Johnny Quest when I was a kid because I had that blonde hair. Th these are all different sketches. But the next one I think is fascinating. This, Ray Spannon is on the right. Ray Spannon was the protector of the Quest family. And on the left is something the animators used as a guide for relative height of different characters in the show. All the bad guys are Asian for some reason. There's Dr. Dr. Fu or something, Dr. Chung or something, and then his henchmen. Was this the 60s? Yeah, there he is. Uh, this, this is the, the 60s, 60s, exactly. So I was curious as to why that, that was the case, but they were the bad guys. They were, you know. Uh, I think there might be one more slide I put in, maybe not. Um, no, that, that's it. John said that's it. Okay, so it was a fun exhibit. My favorite parts of it were the concept art and some of the original sketches for the Flintstones or some of the other. They did not look like they, the first iteration, it was very interesting to see how Fred Flintstone looked. He didn't look like he does now. And then the other thing I loved was storyboards. You know, so storyboards, these little pictures that they used to tell the story and there would be director's notes. And it was all hand, it was really kind of cool to look at all this hand created stuff. Um, well, weren't the Flintstones based on the Honeymooners? Yes. That was the... It was the concept of that. Yeah. At the end of the uh, at the exhibit, of course, Bob and I went to the gift store. And as in all good road trips, Tim gets a toy. Oh, my God. I got a toy. What <laughs> you did get I get? Fred Flintstone with his grand poobah hat. Oh, I love the poobah hat. This is going to go Oh, this is fantastic. Thank you. I think he had to take his hair off to put the poobah cap on. Oh, I love that. I didn't have many. I, I was expecting a lot of stuff. They had a, um, a what was the name of the... Uh, Rosie was the Jetsons. Rosie the Riveter. Okay. Rosie was, Irona was the maid in which show now? Irona was, uh, was that Richie I Rich? Know. I think that was Richie Rich. Rosie was the robot in Jetsons. And they had a little statue of Rosie. And I thought, ah, I feel like maybe I should get this. So I, I thought if it, Bob goes, if it's like 10 bucks, yeah, what the hell. It must have been closing. I see this was marked down. You left the price on it. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> <laughs> but Yogi Bear, Tom and Jerry, which I love. Captain Caveman, I don't know what that is. I have, no, I don't Secret know. Squirrel and Morocco Mole. I don't know what those were. No, they I had don't know pictures either. and sketches of them, but uh, there's some great, great so shows. I you know, I tried to find the shows again. Are they on anymore? Uh, some of them are. Yeah, I'm not sure what network. Uh, Cartoon Network used to run a block of old vintage stuff for a while, and that vintage to them was some of the. You no, know, I would, I would like, to, I would like to watch the Flintstones again or some of those. But a lot of coded humor. A lot of adult yeah. humor is woven in because, as I said, it was a, a sitcom in the evenings. So I said to the woman about the Rosie thing, I said, I, how much is the ro Rosie? She goes, oh, that's like $40. And Bob is like halfway and he just makes this like, no, you're not getting the robot. I'm like, okay. And then she hands me a slip of paper and it's the website address for the store. And she said, it's going to be on sale in about five days. She goes, get it <laughs> half, half price. And this will, you know, so I'll Maybe I'll see about that. Well, that's perfect. But it was a nice drive. If you're in the area of the Stockbridge area, I highly recommend the museum. Um, I have it's a greater. It's a cost to go in. It was about 18 bucks per person. Rockwell. Yeah. And I have a greater appreciation of Norman Rockwell. I've always kind of liked his artwork. Um, he seems to be a very, Amer he's an American artist. Yeah, Americana, right? yeah. But when you see some of these paintings close up and you understand what he was doing, it's like, wow, he, quite a talented guy. He had to work from reference, too. He, he couldn't paint, he had to see a picture to paint from a picture. So everything that he's painted was a someone. An actual picture. Had, had a photograph of someone, yes. Yeah. So that was the, the famous Thanksgiving one. Yeah, I always remember love that. that. Yeah, you know. and I love the fact that there's one of the guys in that picture is looking out of the picture as if it were almost like, like a right. camera. Huh. Fun road trip, though. Well, good. Well, I'm glad you were able to make it. Now I just have to go to, uh, what was my trip? Smithsonian uh, or, or Statue of Liberty? West Island, Statue of Liberty, and the Smithsonian uh, Americana Museum, which had a lot of the TV stuff. Yeah, TV stuff. So what, uh, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. All right. Sadly, uh, one of my favorite James Bond actors passed away. I think it was Tuesday, May 23rd. Uh, but it was a week ago, and it was Sir Roger Moore. And to me, Roger Moore was James Bond. I, Woo! Yeah, that, that, so he died at 80, 89. Good he looks long. a little like Kathy Griffin's husband. What was his name? What was his name? 
Gifford. Frank? It was Frank no, no, Gifford. You're Frank Gifford. About not Kathy. Yeah. Kathy Lee's husband. Didn't that look a little like Frank Gifford, I think? A little bit. Did you get the wrong picture? No, that's Sir Roger Moore. So. You got in the hair dye. Um, the very first Bond movie I saw in a movie theater, I think it's on the next panel, is The Spy Who Loved Me. Um, and do you know the theme song from The Spy Who Loved Me? And, 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 Carly Simon. Nobody it? does it better. Very well, good. Does. <laughs> good. Uh, but I remember. What was, what was the villainess's name? In this movie? I don't remember. It wasn't Pussy Galore or anything, was it? Uh, yeah, one? Pussy Galore was in Goldfinger. Oh, okay. Um, and then there is Dr. Holly Goodhead, <laughs> the movie Moonraker, and then, which is the next panel. And then, so I, as a kid or as a young kid, I, I saw these in the sequence. So it was uh, Spy Who Loved Me, Moonraker, and of course, Fear Eyes Only was Sheena Easton. Your it's only, only, only for you. And then uh, Shirley Bassey did the. Yeah. But every Bond movie had a Bond song, and Adele was the Adele's last. Adele's done the last two. Oh, she, she did fantastic. She's perfect for it. And now it's yeah. Skyfall. Yeah. That was the song. So I came across this article. I'm going to read this because I think it's it's like I feel like Aaron McHugh's visiting reading from one of her books. Um, a, a guy named Mark Haynes, uh, who was a scriptwriter in London, had the chance to meet Roger Moore in an airport when he was seven years old. And here's the story. As a seven-year-old in about 1983, in the days before first-class lounges at airports, I was with my granddad in Nice Airport and saw Roger Moore sitting at the departure gate reading a paper. I told my granddad I'd just seen James Bond and asked if we could go over and I could get his autograph. My granddad had no idea who James Bond or Roger Moore were, so we walked over and he popped me in front of Roger Moore with the words, My grandson says you're famous. Can you sign this? As charming as you'd expect, Roger asks my name and duly signs the back of my plane ticket, a fulsome note full of best wishes. I'm ecstatic, but as we head back to our seats, I glance down at the signature. It's hard to decipher it, but it definitely doesn't say James Bond. <laughs> my granddad looks at it, half figures out it says Roger Moore. I have absolutely no idea who that is, and my heart sinks. <laughs> I tell my granddad he signed it wrong, and he's put someone else's name, so my granddad heads back to Roger Moore, holding the ticket, which he's only just signed. I remember saying... I remember staying by our seats and my granddad saying, he says you've signed the wrong name. He says your name is James Bond. Roger Moore's face crinkled up with the realization he beckoned me over. When I was just by his knee, he leant, o he leant over, looked from side to side, raised an eyebrow, and in a hushed voice said to me, I have to sign my name as Roger Moore because otherwise, Blofeld might find out I was here. Now, Blofeld's the ultimate villain, right? <laughs> He asked me not to tell anyone that I'd just seen James Bond. He thanked me for keeping his secret. I went Aww. back to our seats, my nerves absolutely jangling with delight. My granddad asked me if he'd signed James Bond. No, I said, I got it wrong. I was working for James Bond now. <laughs> many, many years later, I was working as a, screen, a script writer on a recording that involved UNICEF, and Roger Moore was doing a piece to camera as an ambassador. He was completely lovely, and while the cameraman was setting up, I told him in passing the story of when I met him in Nice Airport. He was happy to hear, and he had a chuckle, and he said, Well, I don't remember, but I'm glad you got to meet James Bond. So that was lovely. And then he did something so brilliant. After the filming, he walked past me in the corridor, headed to his car. But as he got level, he paused, looked both ways, raised an eyebrow, and in a hushed voice said, Of course I remember our meeting in Nice. But I didn't say anything in there, because those cameramen, any one of them could have been working for Blofeld. <laughs> <laughs> I was as delighted at 30 as I was at 7. So I, heard that, I read that story, and I thought, That's a great memory. What not that cool? And and how hard was it for Roger Moore to just do that, right? Like, I get was celebrity more accessible in the past? Would you would you see like he said? I don't know if it was well. Yeah, maybe more accessible. I don't know, but you know now they have an entourage with them. Yeah, right. Even the Kardashians, they can't leave the airport without a whole an entourage, and an entourage yeah. with them. I don't know. I wonder about that when I. When I had done, and, and not at the level of Roger Moore, but uh, when I had traveled a little bit with Martina, people never came to love up it. to her. People come up to her all the time, and she used to, what, what would upset her, she said, I don't mind people stopping me, and it is certainly flattering or whatever, but when you're sitting down having a meal, or it's obvious you're in a conversation, you can tell that whether somebody's famous yeah, or not. True. Yeah. Don't interrupt them. You know, if they're eating their dinner or eating something, there's one thing if you bump into someone in the airport, but if you're you're actually eating or doing something, it, it could be a, I think it could be a, a struggle. She always went out with ball cap and sunglasses or tried to- Try to hide. Yeah, yeah. try to hide it a little bit. But I, I, don't, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would have, as a little kid, I think you probably would go up to somebody, but would you go up to 
No, no. You saw Justin Timberlake sitting at the in LaGuardia. Not that he would be, but if you saw him sitting, He's an exception. <laughs> I just might go up to him. <laughs> I have to like. Would you say hi? Like, that's the whole thing. What do you, you say what you hi? Say? Hello. Um, you know who I see work out at my gym now and then is uh, Colin Quinn, um, and he actually does. He opens for Seinfeld when Seinfeld's at the Beacon these days, and I see him talking to the. I don't know who that is. And, and he used to be on. Uh, guys, uh, was Colin Quinn on SNL for uh, for a while? Yeah, he did yeah. Weekend Update. We, okay, okay. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, so, and he writes a lot of Jerry's material. They write, they work together. And I see, literally, I'll be stretching or something feet away from him, and he seems like a really affable guy. But again, and then John Krakowski, who was from The Office and now, you know, is married to Emily Blunt, used to work out at my gym as well. And you'd see him in the locker room. And my, my idea was they probably just don't want to be bothered. They, they probably just want to be doing their thing like yeah. we're doing our thing, right? But I, but I knew, I was like, wow, it's John Krakowski. And he's... Coming out of a shower. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, it's me. <laughs> Can you take John. that down? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get your back? <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. Uh, you take it to the next level, right? Yeah. <laughs> Can I get your back? Sure. I flew on a plane, um, Kirstie Alley and Parker Stevenson, when they were still together. Oh, my God. I we're loved in, him. We he were in first Frank class together. He's about, this, you know, he's about this tall. I didn't know. <laughs> He's a little taller than Fred. <laughs> He's tiny. Really? Yeah. But those stars are. But he, uh, he, he, but he had the, you know, the golden locks hair, and they had their kids with him, and, and uh, they were in the seats up in first class, and just like any other family, but not, right? So, um, but no one bothered them. No one seemed to. Seemed well, that's to an anything. unspoken rule in New York. I don't know if it's the same in Philly, but if you see celebrity. Leave yeah. him alone. The difference would be Judy Gold. She lives on our. She lives on the Upper West Side, and if ever she sees me, she remembers from Syria. She goes, "Hey, how you doing?" You know, just like block away <laughs> with that screeching voice. Love her to death. She's yeah. funny. Yeah, All right. Yeah, so, yeah. what caught your eye? Mine was very obviously different. <laughs> <laughs> so. The publisher's clearinghouse. Do you know what that is? We all we all got the you used to God. get the direct mail pieces, right? So it's a direct mail house. No purchase required, but you kind of thought you had to. You thought you had to yeah. because they would essentially beg you to fill out this form. The you know, so the way their advertising used to work was you've won a million dollars. All you have to do is fill out all this business, and they so they were talking to the head of um, head of marketing there, and he had essentially said that uh, his name is Chris Irving, and he said that. Um, the reason they had all the little stamps where you'd have to yeah, remember stamps, that. Yep. and they would all, they would send you on a wild goose chase through all the different pages so that you would look at every page. Uh, so they're a direct mail house. It's magazines, plus it's a bunch of other things, which I didn't realize. It's lots of kind of that as seen on TV sort of stuff, you know, the copper socks and uh, the, the yeah. twist off jar thing and that business. But they've been around. They're 60 year old direct um, marketing company. And uh, they have a website. So I went on and I think we should go sign up. But the problem is you have to go sign up. And you know once you get in that loop, then you start getting all the emails. But they give away a prize every 10 minutes. Are the probability of us potentially winning something is actually... Well, depends so on how many people sign they up. give away all kinds of things. But the big prize van hits the road 15 times a year. I only thought it was once. Once I did, too. So it's getting ready to get gassed up. It's going out at the end of June, June 25th. It's gassed up. It's, it's going to, uh, or I'm sorry, June 28th. Somebody's going to get $2 million in cash, plus 10000 uh, 10, a month for life and a new car. And they select the winner at random. They said, everybody seems to think you have to buy something. They said, most winners haven't bought anything, but they won't say what the percentage is. Um, they send out millions and millions of these things per year, and they 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 also won't talk about their uh, how they choose their list. I've not received anything in the mail. Have you received anything? It, we must not it, be it part of the target so audience. So long since we got something in the mail from Publishers Clearinghouse. I can't remember the last time something came in. One thing is, so they're privately owned. The one thing I was surprised about, they've given away over the last sixty years three hundred twenty-seven million dollars since they introduced the sweepstakes in sixty-seven. 40% of it goes to goes to charity. Wow. Beneficiaries include St. Jude's uh, Children's Research Hospital, the Bronx Zoo, the National Audubon Society, Alzheimer's Association, the ASPCA, and Susan Komen Organization. So they said that uh, they do they do good in, in that aspect. In April alone, they gave away 100,000 in prizes and 50,000, 20,000, and $10,000 increments. 
This year, though, they they have a new thing that when you fill out your form, they ask you, will you be act surprised or excited if you win the $2 million? Because they show up unannounced. They say sometimes people are in towels or coming out of the shower, or if you're not home, they'll go to work. They'll track you down. I love it, yeah. This is somebody who, who did, this what I thought was brilliant was a Halloween costume a couple did which I thought was funny. So this was their Halloween costume. But the prize, the prize patrol folks, there's usually five of them. They have the cardboard check, and uh, they, they go locally, so they're inconspicuous, I guess. And they buy uh, champagne, roses, and balloons. And you can see in the next slide, it's kind of cheesy. She, she's in that little hood. She almost looks like the WWF wrestler woman with the, with the sign there. But they show up at your house, and they... That, and that team is the team? That's part of the team, yeah. I mean, those are those are not just like temporary. That's how I understood team. it. That's part I, of the because the guy, the the guy with the silver hair, looks familiar from your other pictures. No. So. so, but they uh, they said since since nine eleven, it's been a little harder to. Uh, they've actually boarded aircraft too to make deliveries to tell people they've won, and um, so I thought it was interesting. So I thought, well, I'll just go online and sign up. Sixteen billion five hundred ninety four million eight hundred thirty three dollars and ninety eight cents has been given out. Where does the money come from? People that buy all this stuff. So you buy the magazine subscriptions or you buy, um, you know, copper socks or so a percentage or, of that or piece microwave kit or the robo twist jar opener or the microfiber bath microfiber bath rug. So it's a big direct mail, Got direct, it. Okay. direct okay. to consumer company. So I thought it was funny because I always wondered about who wins these things. My father, did you see the movie Nebraska? Yes. I finally did. Finally did. Yeah, and he, he he travels to to visit relatives. To go yeah. complain. Well, he goes to complain. Well, how come he didn't win? Because the, the the paper said. Now they've been sued a number of times for faulty uh, advertising, mm. or so, people not reading the fine. So print, they've cleaned so, up. They've yeah. cleaned up their act. But my dad was convinced one year he had won. <laughs> he had filled everything out. <laughs> uh, he had all the magazines, and he kept looking out the window. My father's a little bit of a, um, not fantasy. What's the I don't know what the right word is, but he he was convinced he won. He they told him he won. He was waiting for the prize patrol van. Never came. You can see him sitting by the window, moving the curtain aside ever so gently. Yeah. He doesn't want to look like. There was a certain know. amount of innocence my dad had that thought for sure he'd won, but then, of course my mother shot that right down. <laughs> <laughs> Waste of time. <laughs> so that's what that's what caught my eye. The business birthday today is also a interesting thing. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings. But the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So Norman Vincent Peale was born on this day in 1898, May 31st. He died December 24th, 1993, at 95 years old. 95? Yep. He was an American minister and author known for his work in popularizing the concept of positive thinking. thinking. Try, really try. Try, really try. Especially believe, really believe. That was his book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And now he says... The book, since it was published in 1952, that it was on the New York Times bestseller list for 186 consecutive weeks and sold 5 million copies. In fact, Simon Schuster says it did not. <laughs> the power of positive thinking. Said, so they, Simon and Schuster. They printed that many. Okay. Didn't sell that many. They said the claims were exaggerated about the book. It also said the book was translated into 42 languages. They said it, it was not. It was maybe 15 <laughs> languages. <laughs> but he wanted to be. Try, really try. The brain cannot think. Right. When it is hot. So that was, so he, his whole thing was... Um, that if you thought positive, if you were positive make it and happen. you just kept believing and believing and believing, you'd actualize it. So it would happen. So he was criticized. So it, he, he started a radio program in 1935 and then it was on for 54 years. And we know the program because if you're a fan of the movie Grey Gardens. Exactly. The, the Big Edie and Little Edie, listen, they tune in on their little the FM radio and they come and tr the brain cannot function. You got to get on top and gotta stay on things. Top. Does that mean women too? <laughs> so if you look to the picture that I put up here, there's lots written about this guy, but do you see who that is? On the, in the picture. Well, that would watching. be the one of the first Trump wives, right? Right, but that's Donald with, Trump. With Norman Vincent Peale. So Donald Trump was a member of his church. Believe and actually, believe. And actually NPR has done a full study that actually a lot of the success of Donald Trump's campaign came out of teachings from Norman of, Vincent Peale. Norman Vincent Peale's uh, positive thinking. 
And they said uh, Trump employed the power of positive thinking with exaggeration, untruths, and just simply false, a false narrative. And he stayed the course. He never backed off it. They said, if you affirm it, visualize it and believe it, it will actualize itself. So he was criticized. So Peel was it's criticized like the, because like the crowds at the inauguration affirm it, believe it, and don't ever step back. And they said that what was dangerous about this power of positive thinking was for some people, it made them aggressive and then actually very um, silly. Okay. Right. So. But they said, um, and I didn't, so NPR did this whole study and they said that Trump actually thanked, because um, as I said, he would go, his family went to the church. Norman Vincent Peale said, think big and you'll achieve big results. Think success and you'll have success. So they said everything was uns unsubstantiated. There was never any real facts. It was all anecdotal. Man. Trump says, Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking, everybody's heard of Norman, Norman, uh, he says, uh, he was so great. I still remember his sermons. It was unbelievable. And what he would do, he'd bring real life situations to the pulpit, modern day situations. He would bring them into the sermon and you could listen to him all day long. And, uh, and it goes through this whole thing about chapter and verse, what uh, Peel's theories were and formulas were and how Trump followed them. And they gave the example, they said, for instance, Trump got up and said, we're going to win Michigan today when nobody thought he was going to win Michigan and just kept pounding that he was going to win Michigan. And in fact, he won, won Michigan. Michigan. So um, they said it was kind of scary, but I, I thought it was interesting. Um, Peel was also a, a good friend with Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan and, the, and Bill Clinton actually um, had some kind words for him. But I was wondering why this never got more play about Trump and, and Peel. Peel died in 1993, you said? He died in 1993, At but... the age of 95. This so, was the church. So the church is in Manhattan. It's... Um, it's I'm, down on... You, you mentioned it was like on down on 6th Avenue. And so right, it's the... Uh, da, 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 he served as pastor of the Marble Collegiate Church in New York from 1932 until his death, leading a Reformed Church in America congregation. And uh, he said every, Clinton and Donald Trump have praised his teaching. Some of his ideas were controversial. They received frequent crit criticism from people within and out the church, as well as psychiatric professionals. You can see, well, there's a, you know, you and I knew Norman Vincent Peale strictly out of Grey Gardens and, and from a comic effect. Little did I know that... that he our, wasn't tired. He was, yeah, guys. It wasn't me. <laughs> you have to, and I tried finding it on YouTube and I was going to ask you, you to rip it. it. Oh, you should have asked me. I would have been happy to. Because uh, maybe maybe we can play it next week. Actually, we do have that, it in some of our imaging. Try, really, really try. is in our images, in our imaging, sorry. So when we go to break or something, you come back, you might hear Norman Vincent Peale. <laughs> So that was uh, that was wow. it. So hey, um, I was poking around, John. It's so May thirty first, which means what? We're going into June first. Will be June tomorrow. Prime. And so uh, our partner here in the focus group, Deep Discount, um, starting on June first, is having a site wide sale on everything. So not just the DVDs or the movies or VHS tape or vinyl, but the accessories, the clothing. Um, all the all the collectibles and stuff and i went there poking around and so there were two things i was looking for a turntable yeah because i have a lot of vinyl you have vinyl and they actually have like 16 different turn turntables tables. so and i was going to ask you about them because i i just I, i'm not doing it for those you know little sound quality you hear the crackle i just want to play some of those old 80s albums that I have. I have four crates of albums in my basement. Oh, God. And I thought it'd be you fun on a Saturday to pull them out. Can and I tell you what album? you need to do? You need to get a turntable for Rehoboth. Yeah. And then and like... Play the vinyl. So, okay. So, John, I think I put one of the links in there for the turntable page. Um, we were given free reign by our, our good friends at Deep Discount to pick whatever we wanted to talk about. Right. And so I was so happy. So look at all these turntables. No, I couldn't believe it. Some are like some look like they're old, like like an old style. But I'm I'm not sure that. Uh, you know what else I loved is they sell. Remember that the thing you would get the washer with the 
and then you the would squasher. The squasher, the squasher. Yeah, would they wash sell it that. Out. Yeah, they sell that on there too, and I laughed. But it's all discounted too, so that was the great part. That um, not only is there a sale going on, but then there's also some additional coupons. I would say that you and should, other codes that you can hit in to save. They have more four dollars. pages of turntables. Yeah. I think you should say. I think you should spend in the neighborhood of like one one fifty for a, a turn. Well, I was what I was going to ask. So what? I don't, I don't know if I should get something that looks like old that you fold it up there or just get. Something no, you don't want to close mod. and play. You don't want to. No. But we were up at a friend's house recently, and the entertainment was final. We had a ball putting on records. Now this is this is what we used to do in college. Yeah. Without even thinking about it, but at a dinner party, so I was like, "Hey, let's pick a let's pick vinyl." Well, and the great thing about vinyl is actually they were meant to listen to the whole thing. Yeah, it was uh, a, it's it an was album a, experience side there. to side. And then the other thing you asked me to do was to find. You said you know since it is um, Gay Pride, Pride in June. Month. Yep. Um, that you were going to pick a couple of movies. And the first movie I thought of, which I, I thought might surprise you, was Death Trap. Christopher Reeve and Michael, Michael, Michael Caine. Caine. And I think Diane Cannon? Yeah. Who plays, uh, there it is. Yeah, so so Deep Discon has Death Trap on You know Blu-ray. why I picked that? Because it, the twist is that he, Christopher Reeve is in a relationship with Michael Caine. So right? it was 1982. You don't, they didn't reveal that to me. No, late. but it was 1982, and I remember... Being in the theater and in 1982, questioning where where I was in life, and saw two men kiss for the first, first time. time, and it was a real Boom. kiss. Yeah, and I remember the crowd. <gasps> you know, there was it wasn't just two men. It was my. It was Christopher Reeve. Right, and I thought, <laughs> wow, I couldn't believe a. I was watching Superman. So, so that Michael always Kane. made. I love the movie, but it, it always made a big impact on me. So that was the one that I thought. If you, you did a good job. That you would pick. So what, what did and you And I pick? actually rewatched that movie about two years ago because oh, it was one of your favorite movies. And uh, it holds up really well. And it was a stage play before yep. it was a movie, too. So I picked a movie that also goes back to the 80s. And my movie was uh, My Beautiful Laundrette, Daniel Day-Lewis, one of his first pictures. Uh, I'm just going to say the interesting thing about the version that Deep Discount has, it's from the Criterion Collection. Oh, they're great. And the Criterion Collection has super high-quality prints of the movies, plus a lot of extra content about uh, the making of it and behind-the-scenes stuff. So that is a definite must-have. The reason I picked this is it was the first date that Bob and I went on. We had dinner at the Dallas BBQ, and if anybody lives in New York, you know, Dallas BBQ was the early bird special. was five ninety five a person. <laughs> you get like a half a chicken. <laughs> Ice tea, Is that what you fries, did? yeah. And then we went to see my beautiful Andrette. And like your story of when you saw uh, Death Trap, when there are so few representations of gay men or lesbian women in, uh, or you know, L- of the LGBT community in general in popular culture or, or TV or film, that when you saw something, it was very, you know. So D- Daniel Day Lewis plays like a. Uh, it's a very interesting snapshot of Thatcherism and of homophobia and also of immigration because it's a Pakistani, uh, the son of a Pakistani family who forms a relationship with Daniel Day-Lewis. They open up a laundrette and then it goes from there and it's fascinating. It's, I think it's a good movie and I think it holds up. And as I said, if you're gonna buy it, uh, there's a deep discount through our site. There's a little logo and it's a Criterion one. And I think the Criterion label is really a, a high quality thing. And, and another, they always, uh, the other thing that we love about Deep Discount, they always have new releases. So this week's new release is Heart to Heart, the complete series. <laughs> I smiled at this because I used to so watch the show. It was on ABC from 79 to 84, starring uh, Robert Wagner. Robert Wagner and Stephanie Powers, a millionaire couple that, couple that were amateur um, sleuths. sleuths. <laughs> I never watched it. You didn't watch this? You know why? You didn't get ABC, did you? Or no, did you well, uh, we didn't get ABC, but 79 to 84, I was out. <laughs> I didn't watch a lot of TV, and I didn't watch TV in college. I want to say that Heart to Heart, um, something... I like the theme song. Yeah, it had a great theme song, and I seem to think that Heart to Heart was a Saturday show. Was that possible? Still, I was out. Friday or Saturday? I was out. Well, I, I used to watch Heart to Heart, and I, 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 I loved Robert Wagner to begin with, and Stephanie Powers played a, a great uh, opposite... Played nicely opposite him, but it was it was total a different version of yeah. Dynasty or Dallas because they're always really well dressed. They live in the, yeah. the offices, the were opulent. You know, it was a whole thing. So where do where do you find all this stuff again, John? You find it at Deep Discount. Go to FocusGroupRadio.com. Look for the Deep Discount logo. Click through and uh, start your shopping. And again, oh look, John put up the Jetsons, and he's got the Flintstones. Flintstones. You know. 
Yeah, and the Flintstones have like it's look. It's the whole. That, I bet the first season would be the one to get the one John put up because that's the original. Like, I liked when Pebbles came in. Oh, the the kids for later. Okay, yeah. so there's there's later. Yeah. All right. So what do you say, Garrett? Thanks, Deep Discount. <laughs> hey, it's the Focus Group. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, John. We're going to take a really quick break, and when we come back, we have Shop Talk, and uh, we're going to be discussing two articles that I think you'll find very interesting. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. Brought to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Now, back to the Focus Group with Tim and John. Glamour today is nothing but a tight skirt, loose hips, and wet lips. An entertaining look at the world of business. Make it work. Make it work. Make it Make it. Make it work. Work. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. We're all business, except when we're not. We're uh, later on in the show, if you uh, stick with us, it's you get your chance to uh, win some socks. The Gremlins have Socks been figured America, out, by the way. Have we figured Gremlins it out? Gremlins have all been figured out. The problem with the socks, and you identified this years ago, is the envelope they go in yes. and how confusing the postal system can be. <sighs> with, in fact, you want to burn your hair. <laughs> so I think we got it figured out. So Right. So Tim's list is later on, and you get your chance to uh, win some socks and have some fun with us. But right now, John had identified a couple of articles, and uh, we thought they were worth discussing. The first one... The headline is, this came from, uh, was this Newsweek? Newsweek, yeah. It says, telling gay and lesbian teens, quote, it'll get better, doesn't help them cope with stress. It may make things worse. And so I read this article, and, you know, there was that, um, for quite some time, there were a lot of videos done oh. of it gets better, it gets better. And I think they were to benefit the Trevor Trevor which Project, is a, which is a wonderful, organization. wonderful organization. Hotline. But you know, I'll read the line so I say it correctly. But they're saying telling teenagers who are struggling with the stress of being lesbian, gay, or bisexual that everything will get better does not help them and instead can make things worse. A study has found coping with sexual orientation can be a huge source of stress and anxiety for adolescents. A New York-based gay, lesbian, straight education network, network found that 80% of LGBT students between 13 and 21 had been verbally harassed, 40% had been physically harassed, and 60% said they felt unsafe. And they said that this coping mechanism, which was the preve uh, prevailing technique, um, which says, which was, I guess they call it a cognitive strategy, where it says trying to imagine a better future for themselves, um, but how well it works and how well it, it the method works is not known. It reminded me a little bit of the power of positive thinking. thinking. Right? Try, try, really, really try. try. Believe, do. <laughs> well, um, the the study looked at uh, three main coping techniques: uh, cognitive strategies that will get better, alternative seeking strategies, which would be a student asking to move to a new school or finding new friends and LGBT-specific strategies where they get involved with LGBT organizations. The best coping strategy was the third, where teens actively engage in activities, organizations, and resources targeted to the LGBT community. This group was found to have better psychological adjustment and more likely to graduate from high school. In comparison, the other two strategies were associated with a lower likelihood of finishing school, lower self-esteem, poor adjustment, and more symptoms of depression. I think that when you and I talked about this at lunch, the bandwagon, boy, did that train bear a lot of the station. When, I, I think it, it might have been the unfortunate, um, the suicide of that young man who jumped off right. the uh, George Washington Bridge, and suddenly Trevor was flooded with, with interest, and, and then people start all, oh, and it was so easy for us, I don't want to poo-poo it, but it was so easy for someone to record it, it gets better. And so now you have, I don't know how many thousands of minutes of it gets better, but what is that, from a tactical point of view, how do you actually implement it gets better into your life? Well, it's right? telling people, you know, hang in there and take the abuse or take little the verbal. Cat. Hang in there. Yeah, <laughs> and I, and, I um, and, and you're right. And I, I thought what was interesting about this, even taking this to the workplace, if there was a, if you as a kid in high school or college could see that whether there was a, a LGBT uh, affirming club Mm -hmm. at your school, whether it was high school or college or other people that uh, you could relate to, and or at work when they have these employee resource groups that, that let 
other LGBT uh, employees know that um, you're not alone. It's very helpful. I mean, I myself went through quite a struggle in college. I, my GPA went from a 3.8 to a 1.2 one semester. Um, I still remember to this day, these three guys probably don't even pay attention to it, but I was, um, I don't want to say trapped, but I was in a hallway and getting get about ready to get the crap beat out of me. And uh, this one kid, Kelt Naylor from Vermont, Dave Schultz, who I still am in contact with from Ohio, and this other kid, Jim, from Kentucky, three farm boys walking down the hallway and see me about ready to get the crap kicked out of me. And they were all 6'4", 6'5", 6'6". Iowa fed, corn, yeah. You know, it came over and literally just picked these guys off me. Tossed and just them. Tossed them. And, you know, what are you, what are you doing messing with him? Leave him alone. And uh, I... To this day, still still remember that it had such wow. an impact on me that those guys were they, they intervened in a were, were intervening in such a positive way, and, and none of them are gay. You know, it was just that they were just good guys. And uh, but for somebody like me who was struggling with my my sexuality, um, and I moved it over into sports, where I I think gays and lesbians who play sports. Um, try harder to be better or overcompensate, overcompensate yeah. for your masculinity or your femininity. And I had, I had a score in rowing. I still remember this. It was questioned. I was questioned all the way through that I couldn't possibly have such a high score on the ERG to make it into the varsity boat and was tested over and over again. On that rowing machine, the ERG. And, um, machine, and I kept proving yeah. myself that I could do it. But it's it was, I think, had I, again, it was the early 80s, but had I had a place to go or somebody to talk to, I think um, it would have been good for me. Now, whether I would have gone and talked, I don't know. I The, the article concludes by saying that the community-based, that third option of finding a, a, a club or a community, everybody needs community, everybody needs support, and it's really important, particularly in adolescence. You know, um, it just reminds me that, you know, that first strategy of it gets better, that requires a lot of it, it, it's Norman Vincent Peel, yeah. right? It's it's that positivity thing that you got to have on ten or eleven all the time. Got to go away, and and that is a hard thing to maintain in the face of, you know, we were you and I were pretty fortunate in where we grew up. I think being on the East Coast um, in a smaller school system, uh, you know, I didn't really encounter too many. I don't have a memory of any problems either through high school. You didn't have any in college? Through college, you know, not, certainly not college. I don't remember college at all. In fact, college, well. <laughs> I dated girls in college. I thought that was fine by me. So Bob never wants me to talk about that. But get laid. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Who knew? I'll just say that 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 was that was delightful because it all made to work that way. So anyway, um, <laughs> but you know, I remember one girl I I fooled around. With, she's afterwards. She's like, you know, so and so thinks you're gay. That's not possible. I'm like, well, you know, well, who's that picture? That's, is that your brother there on the nightstand? Um, you could have got married and had some Nash babies. Could have had Nash babies, yeah. And going out for milk for a couple have... hours. Yeah. <laughs> Honey, I'm going out for milk. So anyway, that was, uh, but I think everybody's situation is different. And I think had I been in a different school or something, um, or had a, but I had a, I, I don't know, I just had a group of friends that no one was even thinking about that. It was all about watching MTV Who's got the weed? <laughs> Are we going to do this movie tonight? Are we playing a drinking game? The other stuff was so. So you, you were know. on a yeah, you were on a very different track. I was the the rowing team and fraternity, mm -hmm. so it was hyper hyper masculine, masculine. Yeah. You know, the beer drinking boys, frat yeah. boys. So, but um, I guess we turned out okay. We did, and we landed on our feet, and uh, it did get better, even though we. <laughs> We just poo poo that. The next article I laughed at, and I thought Love of you immediately. One. And the the headline is why you should learn to say no more often. And the the my big takeaway out of this was that so many times we overcommit ourselves, or we'll say, um, we'll say yes to something because it's easier to say yes than it to come up to with either no. an excuse or to try to nicely say no. And I loved the uh, little nuance here where it, they said there's a difference between I don't versus I can't. I can't. Yeah. So if I said to you, do you want to go to dinner? And you said, oh, I can't tonight, but maybe another time. I can't opens up the possibility. Means that there's yeah. possibility. If you say, you know what, I don't do dinners on the week, during the week. That day. shuts it down. Then, oh, okay, I'll never ask again. Yeah. But I didn't insult you. I just said, you know what, I don't do dinners on during the week. And... Um, 
I thought that one little nuance, and they said that could be for anything. It could be, um, Would you like to I buy don't, I don't buy magazine subscriptions, magazine subscriptions or... from door to door solicitors or whatever it is. But do you find yourself saying you've always been pretty good about saying no? Uh, I... Except when it comes to family stuff. That I and sh they they make With that differentiation in here. They say that family and work are two exceptions, where sometimes yeah. you just can't say no. No, I'm I'm bad about saying yes, and I probably do offer my time a little too quickly. Um, you think you say yes too much? I, I do. I, in fact, I know I do. Um, with school, though, when I started the animation program uh, now a year and a half ago, now my time is so fixed. I know I need about 15 to 20 hours a week to do my assignments. You've been very disciplined with now that. Now I know I can say no because I have I do have something else. You know, check back with me at the end of the semester is <laughs> what I should say to people, right? You and yeah. I, you and I talked about this before. There's uh, the Tim Russert rule, which he had made a comment uh, right before he passed away. I remember hearing him on the radio, and he said, you know, in the D.C. circuit, he said, I get asked to so many social functions and so many things, and you can't say no to everything. He said, so when I do say yes to something and I go, I act like it's the only place I want to be. That's right. I remember you mentioned. So, that. so whenever I do do something that maybe I. Eh, but I've committed to it, I'll go and try to put on the happiest face. In the past, I would probably go and be a little grumpy. Um, that it was <laughs> there. I've never, ever seen you. Oh, like my God. Oh. Steve yeah. Dilworth used to call me the penguin. Yeah. Rah, 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 yeah, all you needed was a long cigarette holder. I was always like, I can't believe we had to do this. That, 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 that. So, <laughs> but, so I've gotten better about, you know, this is just lovely. Thanks for having me. I'm having a wonderful time. What time is it? Can I go? But, well, and, uh, but, and Tim Russert being uh, Tim Russert, I used to love him when he did uh, Meet the Press. Um, he would get probably asked to a ton of yeah, stuff, right? all the like, time. And, and, and I like his comment, like, you can't say no all the time. Yeah. So he cherry-picked his events. And when he did go, he acted like it was the only place he wanted to be. Didn't, he, didn't you have a story about him at some cocktail party where Subaru came up? Yeah, he had wanted to know, and I forget who told us this, but he had... Was it Mahoney? He had gone up to him and, and uh, he said, what's up with all the lesbians buying Subarus? <laughs> Every lesbian I know is buying a Subaru. Yeah, and, we're uh, responsible. Well, that was us. So uh, we laughed, though, but we always thought it'd be fun to have him on to talk about that because yeah. he certainly noticed it. A lot of people, a lot more people notice that than we ever imagined, I think. Oh, yeah. You bet it. You uh, bet. So those were, those were two great two articles. Uh, so uh, two great articles. be wary of it. It'll get better. Not, not, not a bad sentiment, but it might not solve people's problems as much as finding a good community would. <laughs> um, and then it's okay to say no. And you can be more assertive. That was the other thing about this. You can be more assertive than you think you are. A lot of times when we say no, we think we're being a little too assertive. But when you ask somebody what they thought, they thought, no, that, that didn't bother me at all. So you, yep. you can actually be a little firm about that. All right, so now we're going to take a little break, and we're going to do a, a, a great video on, you know, VW sponsors um, road racing and uh, BMX racing. This is a road racing thing. This is my thing for cycling. But while we do this, we're going to put up, what is Tim's list for today? So before we do Tim's list, I want you to pick two numbers between 2 and 10. I'm going to pick. I'm going to be a little more generous today. I'm going to pick 1. <coughs> no, so you can't pick 1. One's already Oh, sorry. All right, I'm going to pick 3 and 9. So if you guess one, three, or nine, you get a pair of our famous socks. So today's list, since uh, it was something that um, John and I were talking about a while back, cookies in the United States. So th these are the top-selling cookie brands in the USA for 2016. These were the top-selling cookie brands in the U.S. in U.S. dollars in millions. So if you guess number one, three, or nine, you'll get a pair of our famous Focus Group Radio socks. Should people do it on Facebook, too? You do it on Facebook as well or through YouTube. Well, we, we're not hooked up to YouTube, but call us at 877-962-6846. Again, 877-962-6846. Or, John, you, you're going to follow along on it. Get it up here on the iPad. Let's on see the iPod. We're so we're looking. So after the uh, movie, John, we're going to do the top-selling cookie brands in the USA in U.S. dollars. Oh, oh, look at you. you got oh, so a little <laughs> bit I, I just got the time delay, too. So. so so take us out, John. Oh, uh, so we'll be right back after this, and it's the top-selling cookie brands, 877-962-6846, or I'm checking the iPad. We'll be right back.
to you by Volkswagen. Visit VW.com to learn more. Cycling is such a team sport in that there's team tactics and it, it takes a team to win a race. The dynamic during a road race in a big peloton of riders really changes a lot from moment to moment. In order to set the leader up so that they can rest, we're trying to force other teams to chase. The sport of cycling is a team sport and so there's a lot of tactics that are involved. They pace you back up, they pace you off the front of the peloton, they protect you from the wind and they also give you a lot of moral support and team camaraderie. They're not just my teammates and my coworkers, but they're my friends and the people who I'm with all year. You have to have a cohesive team that you've bonded with both on and off the bike. It ends up being part of what your family is as well. Knowing that the team car is behind me, it has my back, and it's with us at all times gives me a lot of confidence. And the director is usually driving the car as well as a mechanic. Letting us know where we're going, how we're going to get there, and what's going to arise when we come around the next corner. The bike gives me a sense of freedom. I love the air in my face. I love the adventure it brings, and I love the challenge to push myself and uh, find out what I'm capable of. I think that pushing your body to your own limits, there's nothing better. At the end of the day, it's something you have to put your heart and soul into in order to be successful. You get tired and you're thinking about how hard it is, but then you kind of remind yourself. You get to race your bike every day, and you get to go out there and do something you love every day, and not many people get that opportunity. Focus on the savvy side of 9 to 5 with the Focus Group. And in business a week, I got more money and I know what to do with. Listen, laugh, and learn with Tim and John. Herrera Rocher. Yeah. He is doing well. Hey, welcome back to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, John Nash. We're all business, except when we're not. We're uh, going to do a Tim's list this week. We have a little bit of time left. And uh, this week's list is the top-selling cookie brands in the USA and this was for 2016 in U.S. dollars. Our number is 877-962-6846. John's also monitoring our Facebook feed if you want to play along. Every, everybody knows us really well on Facebook. And <laughs> all right, I'll kick it off by saying, um, Paul, and this is just a funny one, came up with Keebler Fudge Stripes. Fudge Stripes. <laughs> and he put Not it, on the list. And he put it in brackets. It only sounds naughty because I said it. <laughs> <laughs> but look what I found as we wait for some calls to uh, Hey, these are those Pop Rocks, These right? are the Firework Oreos. So I wanted to use, oh, guys. I wanted these last week for, the, for Memorial Day or for the 4th of July coming up. But these are the Pop Rocks Firework Oreos. Have you tried them? No, um, and a friend of mine sent me a picture of them, and they and they, I read this thing about these little grains or the psh, the things that pop, right? Right. So we'll, we'll we'll we used to do back in the day. We used to always taste these. They haven't come out with cookies in a while, so these are the pop rock ones. I didn't like pop rocks as a kid because they always hurt my hurt, hurt the roof of my mouth. Do they pop? You can hear them. <laughs> They're not going to hurt you, but you can hear them going off. It's like a fizzy. It's, it's, it's exactly what it is. So the fireworks Oreos, are they a hit, John? It's a plain old Oreo cookie with Pop Rocks, so I give it a nine. I mean, oh, that's pretty because good. Because it's, it's an Oreo cookie, but it's got the Pop Rocks, so you got that going on. So okay. If you, so if you have any guesses for our list this week, I'm um, guessing number one, three, or nine, you get a pair of our famous socks. And uh, Let's see if Mr. Smarty Pants, the smartest man in Alabama, knows. Let's go down to Don. Don, welcome to the show. The only reason I'm saying, the only reason I'm choosing is because they really should be a sponsor for you guys going back about five years, and that's I know. Oreos. What did you get? You guessed Oreos? <laughs> Oreos. Do you have a specific type of Oreo? Oh. For me personally, or just for just this? Just for your guests, yeah. Uh, I would say, I guess, the standard chocolate Oreo. Well, that's a good guess. That's number two. <laughs> 778 million dollars worth of oreos sold in 2016 they were also if you're wow. watching along the picture they're the ones who did the famous pride cookie the oreo pride with the rainbow on there so that's that such a simple cool yeah. little ad to do right mm -hmm. so that's oreo so that was the uh the number two most popular cookie brand in the u.s now, so, you know so close don i'm gonna say i bet something else science related caught don's eye today that was in the news what was that? NASA just launched a six-year mission to explore the sun. 
It's hot. It's a ball of gas. Don, do you believe this? <laughs> <laughs> Don, I know you're listening, but it gives us life. It's the center of the solar system. We might. What are you, you going to look at at the sun? You got to explore. Are okay. You get close to it before it blows up. They, the craft is designed to. Uh, they're going to get as close as the orbit, a little or closer than Venus, I think. All right. So a number of you online guessed Terrence guessed Oreos. Um, <laughs> I think Billy was like, Girl Scout cookies? Well, everybody loves a girl. Well, Girl Scout cookies is right. Who guessed that? That was Billy Kittner, Billy. I'm going to say he's right only because private label cookies came in number one. So Girl Scout cookies would be considered private label with 1,085,000,000. Okay, we also, you know, Paul did the Keebler fudge stripes. Of course he did. Um, okay, uh, Danielle, Daniel, um, on Facebook guessed Nabisco Chips Ahoy. That's number three. All right, so Daniel, very good. Uh, I'm going to make a note of that. I, I got to reply to him. So Daniel got Chips Ahoy. Excellent job, Daniel. And he, he got Nabisco Chips Ahoy. Nabisco Chips Ahoy. I, I like Ahoy. when you do brand and then brand So, is Nabis so Nabisco uh, Chips Ahoy, number three, which John picked, 608 million. 700,000 and so I'll, I'll respond to his comment. Now, Terrence, uh, one of our listeners on Facebook, shortbread cookies? Not on the Short, list. Would shortbread kind of be like a Lorna Dune? Is that like a shortbread cookie? I think so, yeah. yeah Lorna, Lorna Dunes. <laughs> Lorna Dunes! The Lorna those Dunes. Walker ones, those British ones, the Walker ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know what Paul just said on Facebook? Right? I said, let's go to Don, the smartest man in Atlanta or Alabama. Paul goes, it's not hard being the smartest guy in Alabama. <laughs> it's so nasty. What are Paul? Paul and Mass likes my shirt today. He told me that this was a good color for me, this yeah. blue. All right, so, oh, okay, Bob out in on the West, Bob Sullivan, he guessed Milano's from Pepperidge Farm. Pepperidge Farm number 10. Number Pepperidge 10, Farm okay. Milano's, 133 million. So we got number, we got one, we got three. We're still looking we for number one, nine. We got one, two, three, and 10. We're still looking for number nine. <laughs> I guess I guess it works better if you're on Facebook because uh, Daniel just goes, yeehaw. He's, he won with Chips Nabisco. This chips, is so tough. We, we under, so, so Don's back on. Don, you got cut off. Hello, oh. Don. Don. This is this is for Paul. Paul, we have the second largest concentration of PhDs per capita outside of Silicon Valley, California, in the country. <laughs> this is a nasty little cat fight coming. Got, you know, we the got to show we, over. To we take two calls. We should get Paul to call in and have Paul go at it with him, <laughs> and then and then sign off. Yeah. Let them go at let, it. Let, let Paul <laughs> let Paul and Don tangle. No, I don't want to tangle with Paul. Uh, and then and he Paul just came back with per capita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you guys are the best <laughs> thank All you don right. take care Bye -bye. And, and guess what i think we have a final winner for the list tim who's that uh, someone just said you go down i hope you don't mind that i'm doing split well you know it's we understand it's tough okay, at work so to, be, it, it, to be watching we used to be on serious uh you call tim would car. drive me crazy if i went on the ipad but I, it's my job to check this out now right so um deb one of our viewers who's watching right now, Deb guessed a uh, flavor, Nilla Wafers. Nilla Wafers comes in number nine. So congratulations Deb, to she Deb. She won socks. So Deb, good job. 153 million in sales. So John, where should people contact <laughs> you if they won socks? By the way, Bob just says for Alabama, they count their voting by county there too, despite the gerrymandering. <laughs> um, so if you've won today, and that would be Daniel and uh, Deb, uh, drop us a line at letters at focusgroupradio.com or focusgroupradio uh, at gmail.com. But letters at focusgroupradio.com is easy to remember. The best place, letters at focusgroupradio.com. And so send us your address and we'll get the socks to you. Yep. That reminds me, not, not to pick on Don in Alabama, but I remember Arkansas, we were, when I was working at Subaru, we were doing direct mail pieces. This is Arkansas, so they're not so Alabama. Someone says okay. we could save a lot of money when we send in a direct mail piece to Arkansas. And we all said, why? And he said, well, because it's transferable between family members. So we just have to send one end to t just send Whoa. one, just send one direct mail piece to Someone the state. Someone said this? Oh, yeah. But that's, you know, <sighs> super. Wow. So let me go, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through the list. So thanks, everybody, for really playing. got the private label one, right? And uh, so these were the top-selling cookie brands in the USA and U.S. dollars. So starting at number 10, 
was Pepperidge Farms Milano cookies, which I've always uh, loved. Oh, Milano is like the perfect cookie. Yeah, right? you know they sued Trader Joe's for copying their packaging yeah, and everything. Yeah. There's a there's a, a new one out that's marshmallow that I'd like to try, and they also have the orange chocolate one that's out. Orange chocolate's good. Yeah, but the marshmallow one I'd I like to like try. That. Number nine, uh, Deb got Nabisco Nilla wafers. Dogs I, love those too. I as Ryan's a kid, dog Rex. Did loves you not those. love these cookies as a kid? I don't. I love really Nilla wafers. Them. I loved them. Number eight was a brand I didn't know until I saw the packaging, Loft House. So those are those things that are always at the grocery store, kind of on the table somewhere with the goofy yeah, colors. sure, I recognize those. Yeah, I didn't ever like those things. I think they were too cakey for me, but Loft House cookies. Number seven, I've never had one of these, Nabisco Belvita. Do you know what that is? They're like a breakfast cookie. That is cookie. totally like a new thing that does not rank. 187.8 million, the number seven it looks best like Look, cookie. It, it looks like it has two calories. There's no fun in that cookie. No. There's no fun in that. Number, <laughs> number six, Little Debbie's Nutty Bar. Oh, Little Debbie. 239 million, even some crazy queen got a had a wedding cake done, you can see over there on the right. Little Debbie. Little Debbie Nutty Bars. Can I tell you, Little Debbie is no friend of anyone's waistline. She doesn't give a crap about 239 million. Waistline. Little Debbie. Number five, Nabisco Oreo Double Stuff. It was the Oreo with one Double F. Stuff. Double stuff and came They only in? spelled it with one F. F. Okay. There's the difference between <laughs> you're watching online. The, squirt the difference gun between is on the, for 2.2 2 seconds longer for the double stuff. The right? European right. one's on the right and the American one's on the left. left. The uh, number four is Little Debbie, just uh, in general, but mostly those oatmeal things. Oh, you 264.5 million. Did you, have, did you have Hostess or Little Debbie? We had Little Debbies, but I, I didn't like Little Debbie. I liked Hostess better. You, you can see, you probably can't see it because my little picture's there, but there was a little thing there that I thought you would like. Little Debbie has some crack for you, You bet she does. Number three is Nabisco Chips Ahoy with 608.7 million. Number two was Nabisco Oreos at 778.8. And the number one selling actually brand cookie. And then private label cookies were 1 billion, 85 million. So that was everything from Girl Scout cookies to um, someone else, a store that would do their own brand of something. So I thought private label was a little bit eh, but I'm glad somebody, I'm glad somebody got it with Girl Scout cookies. Because that was a hard one. Well, think about and the, then John got to try these uh, firecrackers. They're not bad. They're not bad. You can take them home. Or, or, them or, or I'm sure that the booth is going to want some. Uh, uh, yeah, Ali's like, yeah, we'll get a Pop Rock Oreo cookie in here. So that was that. Hey, everybody, thank you for making time to join us today. We, uh, If you join us on Facebook or YouTube, especially Facebook, thanks for all your comments. Um, a big thanks to Deep Discount uh, for being a part of our show every week. Check out some of the titles that Tim and I mentioned, as well as the turntable thing, which I think is really cool that they sell those. Are you going to get one? I saw you send that to me, and I began looking through, and I thought, God, a turntable. Because I, I have two crates of records, yeah, and, and I, can't I use would them. love to play them again. And a big thanks to Volkswagen Group of America. They've been with us for about 7.5 to 8 years. You know, 8 years. Like 8 years. Let's say 8 years. Uh, please, by all means, check out the new Atlas. Uh, Tim and I are driving the uh, all-track wagon, which we love. I just put a bike rack on top of mine. And uh, the Tiguan arrives, the new Tiguan. Is that like end of a year, a month or two? Yeah. Okay, it's going to be a bigger one, but there's, they're going to keep the actual Tiguan. They're calling it the Legacy Tiguan, the current model, but they're going to have a new one as well. So that's VW.com for anything Volkswagen. Uh, as Tim always says, please don't text and drive. Uh, have a great week, great weekend. Welcome to summer, and we'll see you next week. Can you do your pride leprechaun? Happy pride. That's there the top of the pride to you. Pride. And the hand has to do this, the pride. <laughs> <laughs>